The presidential debate heard by many Americans on Sunday evening included the representatives of two major political parties, the Republican and Democratic nominees. Excluded from that debate was the nominee of the Libertarian Party of the United States, who appears on 47 state ballots and the ballot in the District of Columbia. That nominee is former Congressman Ron Paul, who served four terms in the Congress of the United States and who is a practicing physician and is the nominee of the Libertarian Party. Dr. Paul, we tonight have uh, eliminated those questions from the debate which were purely personal and addressed to the candidates. We're going to phrase the other questions to you exactly as they were asked of the candidates. You will have two minutes to respond. In instances where two questions may be accurately synthesized into one, we've done so. Otherwise, they're going to be asked verbatim as they were of the other debaters Sunday night. First question, the polls say the number one domestic issue to a majority of voters is drugs. What is it about these times that drives or draws so many Americans to use drugs? Well, that's a good question, and uh, I'm not sure anybody has the answer, but certainly the dependency of the American people on uh, social and welfare programs have taught us to not have a good sense of worth about ourselves. So people have resorted to drugs, and of course the two worst drugs uh, today are alcohol and tobacco. We're losing 450,000 people a year from smoking and drinking. But the irony there is that we subsidize tobacco and the state governments are selling the alcohol, which I think is rather terrible. But uh, the drug problem is a serious problem, but it's something that should be out of the realm of government trying to solve it. We never had drug laws before 1914, and there's been a 4,000% increase in the use of cocaine since we've had the drug laws, so they're really not doing any good. And when you think that we can't even keep drugs out of the prisons due to the corruption, I don't think there's much chance we're going to keep them off the streets. So we better be more practical about it. And our approach is, as libertarians, is that we should get rid of the laws. The laws don't work. They're not any good. And that uh, they create a lot of corruption. Uh, uh, the drug dealer's out of business overnight if we get rid of the drug laws. Crime rates go down. The average uh, addict commits 260 felonies a year just raising the money to pay his friendly drug dealer for the drugs. And I think if we didn't have the drug laws, kids would be less exposed, and I think that's very important. But kids are enticed. You know, it's pretty hard taking a job at McDonald's at 3.35 an hour if they can make four or $500 a day. So I think it's all backfired. The real issue is freedom of choice and responsibility, and we believe that falls on the individual, the family, and the churches to deal with these very difficult problems, not the government. The government has failed, and they'll continue to fail at this, in this approach. Another troublesome issue is the bulging federal deficit. Would you identify three specific programs you're willing to cut to bring that deficit down? Well, I don't know of any program I wouldn't be willing to cut. And the three specific areas should be domestic welfare spending should be cut, military welfare spending, and the military spending overseas, including foreign aid, it should be cut. And if we had a sound monetary system, we could cut the part of the budget which is growing most rapidly, and that's the interest on the national debt. But when we have 10% interest rates and they're going to go a lot higher, then we can expect this to be a great deal of difficulty. The basic problem is that everybody in Washington talks a lot about it, as does the other two candidates, but they have no solution whatsoever because they're terrified to suggest they need to really cut. But you know, we can't cut unless we address the very important subject of what the role of government ought to be. And we as libertarians believe the role of government ought to be for the preservation of liberty. Not for welfareism, not to police the world, but to restrict the role of government to the preservation of liberty. Then we can address the subject of the waste and the fraud and the corruption and the welfare. And really it's a mistake to think poor people get to benefit from the welfare system. It's a total fraud. Most welfare go to the rich of this country, the military industrial complex, the bankers, the foreign dictators, and it's totally out of control and we should immediately balance the budget the first year no more four-year plans that stretch out into 8 12 16 and 20 year plans and no attempt whatsoever the true deficit per year is closer to a quarter trillion of dollars if the po if politicians would tell the truth it's not 150 or 160 because when you add up the off-budget items and the borrowing from the trust funds we realize that this country is in desperate shape and we better do something about it. Why put the burden of this problem on the next generation? Let's deal with it by cutting the spending. Today, 37 million Americans, including many working families with aging parents and young children, cannot afford any health insurance, yet they earn too much to qualify for Medicaid. What would you do to provide protection for them and how would you pay for it? 
Well, that, uh, me delivering medical care is not uh, a role for government. They've been trying to do this for 30 or 40 years, and that's why we have 38 million people that don't have health benefits. When you destroy money, prices go up. When the government interferes in certain segments of the economy, those prices go up more r rapidly. So when you see the cost of education and the cost of medicine going up faster than anything else, it's not because uh, of the gouging uh, uh, procedure. It's due to the fact that government injects more money into these areas, but it's a failed system because it doesn't broaden the distribution. It only raises costs, and of course the quality goes down. I can't understand why the American people would even give the slightest consideration for uh, government health programs. They don't want the government to deliver their automobiles or their video cassette recorders or their food. And so I don't see why they should have the government delivering health care when it's such a failure. If they're pleased with the idea, they ought to go visit an Indian reservation and find out what it's really like. They ought to go visit the VA hospitals. I mean, it is not the way to deliver health care. The best way to deliver health care is the way we deliver all goods and services in a free society. And uh, I think the cost of uh, the uh, medical care is up precisely because government is involved. But the sooner we get the government out of it, the better. The sooner we have a sound monetary system and eliminate uh, the price inflation, the better off the poor people will be. But when prices go up in these particular areas, who gets hit the most? The low middle income person who's just struggling with a job. Of course, they're the people who lose the job first when the economy goes into a slump. But this idea that government has services or goods that they can pass out is a complete farce. Governments have nothing. They can't create anything. They never have. All they can do is steal from one group and give it to another at the destruction of the principles of freedom, and we ought to challenge that concept. At the end of September, doctor, thousands of AIDS patients are going to lose their access to AZT, which is the only federally approved drug for treatment of the disease. What's your position on extending that aid, and what is it you think the government ought to be doing about making AZT and other drugs available to people who are suffering from this disease? This is a good example of government distribution of uh, medicines and health care. Uh, they're getting ready to take it away. How long did they keep it off the market? Years before it was available. We have turned sick people in this country, people suffering from AIDS and cancer, into smugglers. They have to go to countries that we think are less free and more socialistic, to places like Mexico, to pick up drugs in order to treat themselves uh, either for cancer or for AIDS. And the FDA is the trouble. We need to get rid of the FDA. The FDA prevents medications from coming on the market. They prevent freedom of choice. So we think the government should be out of the business. The fact that they can come down on us and say in September there will be no more AZT. People ought to have freedom of choice. But nobody can be defrauded. A physician or health uh, group cannot come and say, I have a cure, and if you pay me $10,000, I'm going to save your life. They have to be honest about it. But we should never take away freedom of choice in health care. People should have a choice. And therefore, I think this problem with ACT demonstrates so clearly how detrimental it is when government gets involved in taking care of these kind of problems. Estimates of the homeless range from a low of 250,000 to around 3 million including working families and their children. What commitment are you willing to make to this voiceless segment of our society? I think this, is, this should be our greatest concern. It certainly is for me as a libertarian candidate because this is where I address my message so often. If one understands the economic system of government intervention, deficit financing, spending, and the monetary system, they will realize that the in the process of destroying money, that is the inflation, uh, we realize by history and, and by economic thinking that the middle class gets wiped out. So I believe these figures are very, very high. We did not have homeless like this 50 and 60 years ago. So we create these people. And the cities compound the problems. The more regulations in a city for building codes and all kinds of regulations, the worse the problem is. If there are rent controls, you have more homeless. So government creates these people. And the sooner we understand this, balance our budget, Restore soundness to the monetary system. Get interest rates down. Under a gold standard, interest rates are 25 to 3%. But how can people buy houses and make the payments if we have this continued 
inflation where the low middle income and the poor people get wiped out at the, uh, at the sacrifice uh, to a lot of other people. The wealthy get wealthier, the poor get poorer under this current system that we have today. And we should change it, but the American people never get to hear the alternative. That's why we as libertarians offer this approach to, def to government, which is quite different from what the Republicans and the Democrats offer, because they offer the same thing over and over again, more deficits, more spending, more funny money, and more poverty. The American dream of home ownership has become an impossible one for many of the young people of our nation who are caught up in the economic squeeze of the middle class. What promise can you realistically hold out to these people with the cost of housing going up and with limited help available from Washington? Are we destined to become a nation of renters? If we continue to do what we're doing, if we continue the policies of the Republicans and Democrats, there's really no difference. Democrats say Republicans don't spend enough, but there's no evidence to that. When they talk about cuts, they're talking about cuts in the proposed increases. I mean, we're not out of the housing business, uh, but who benefits? Do the poor people get the houses? No, the money ends up in the pockets of many builders and financiers, and, and the houses last for 10 or 20 years, and then the uh, individuals come in to tear the houses down. One of the most important things would it be to have low interest rates, sound monetary system, jobs for people, savings again. But uh, when the government gets involved in the distribution of houses, it comes out about the same as the distribution of medical care uh, or the distribution of AZT or whatever. It causes more problems. Uh, prior to 50 years ago, uh, we didn't have homeless. And the people had houses. People built their houses. They went to work. They had jobs. It wasn't the responsibility of government to build houses. The responsibility was on us to work, to build our houses, to take care of ourselves. And that is out of the realm of government. Government is there to preserve liberty, to guarantee a free, free market, to make sure we have a sound currency, but not to get in the business of passing out favors and privileges and redistributing the wealth, bankrupting the country and impoverishing our people and delivering the debt and the problems to the next generation. That's what has to come to an end. Two questions asked during Sunday's debate dealt with seeming contradictions that one candidate favors the death penalty but opposes abortion, the other opposes the death penalty but would permit abortions positions which the questioners saw as contradictory on the issue of preserving life. Can we have your comment on the issues of abortion and the death penalty? Yes, it, it isn't one of the easiest issues. I think we can find divergence of views in, in all areas. The libertarian principle is that we pledge never to initiate force or aggression against another individual. We can't steal from people, we can't hurt them, we can't murder, and we can't damage their property. And uh, certainly to me this is very clear as a physician that uh, if you take a fetus which is alive and legal, has legal rights, the fetus can sue me if I injure the fetus. So I know very much about the legality of the fetus. So uh, I believe the fetus deserves protection. I happened to have witnessed one time a two, two pound baby uh, being aborted that was born alive, breathing and crying. They threw the baby away. That's an act of aggression. Other libertarians disagree with me on this issue. It's a very important issue. I happen to believe if we don't believe in the integrity of life, protect life, there's not much else the government ought to be doing. I want a very limited government, but I believe it should protect life. And therefore, the fetus is legal, deserves this protection, but I believe it should be handled at the local level. I do not believe there should be federal laws. We don't even have federal laws against theft and murder and other things. Uh, under our system of ju uh, justice, it's done locally. It should be dealt with uh, locally. But to be callous and uh, uncaring about human life, I think it would be very difficult for us as, as libertarians to defend liberty uh, the way we want to. There is an explosion of single-parent families, many with unwanted children, which are the source of poverty, school dropouts, and crime, which many people in the inner cities simply feel is out of control. Where would you get the money to devote to the inner cities, which is clearly needed, according to the questioner? Can you be specific about programs, not only that you would reinstate, but the more imaginative ones that you would begin? Well, I'd get the government out of the business of dealing with the inner city, and I'd certainly get them out of the business of interfering with the development of the inner city. Uh, I like the idea of enterprise zone. I'd like to make the United States a free enterprise zone. But there has been proposals for f enterprise zones where taxes would be lowered, regulations would be lowered, the rent controls would be taken away, and if there were no regulations and no income taxes, and uh, the people then would have a great uh, uh, increase in incentives to go into the inner city and work. 
But the inner city problems are created by government. It is the uh, government program's been working for 50 years trying to take care of the inner city, and it's worse than ever before. I think it's the, uh, of course, I think you mentioned the basic, uh, basic flaw. There's a flaw in our morality in this country, the fact that there are a lot of divorces. And if that creates problem, how can we compensate for the problem? How can we deal with a symptom if the basic problem is that we have single parent home, uh, families? Uh, that is a problem. But a government law can't deal with that. We can't write a law and say that you can't have divorce anymore. That would be foolish. But to, to suggest that government just extract funds from one group and transfer them over to another group because they created a, uh, a problem because there have been divorce, this makes it much more complicated. The free market, a healthy economy, a sound currency can deal with these social and economic problems much better than with government interference. Besides, government does not have the right to do it. The poor person can't steal from his neighbor, and we as libertarians say the government can't do the stealing for him either. Therefore, it's up to us to provide for the general welfare, to take care of the general environment, to make sure everybody has an equal opportunity to get a job and work their way out of the situation. For the last 40 years, Americans have been taught to regard the Soviet Union as the enemy. Yet President Reagan has signed two arms control treaties and has promised to share Star Wars technology with the very country he called the evil empire. Should we be doing a lot to help the economic and social development of a country we have so long regarded as an adversary? Not directly, and uh, I think it is uh, rather ironic. Here we have uh, a president talked about the evil empire, and most people think he's strong anti-communist, and we gotta have the Republicans in because they will stand up to the communism. It's precisely under these conditions that you have the treaty signed. Not only that, not only have we signed the treaties, but the subsidies to the Soviet Union are going up. I mean, we have continued the subsidies throughout this administration and increased them to the Soviet bloc nations. Now we're ready to consider the Soviet Union as a most favored nation status, which means that the American taxpayer is less favored. That means the American taxpayer is gonna be required to subsidize loans to the Soviet Union. And the whole idea that we invite Soviet agents over here to inspect our bases doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I think openness is good. I think we should talk to them. I think we should change our foreign policy. I think we should be less provocative. We should come home and we should have friendly relationship, but we should never require the American taxpayer to subsidize our enemy. I think communism is an enemy, but I happen to think that it is uh, a very, very weak enemy if we didn't subsidize it. Our Western banks, guaranteed by the American taxpayer, are loaning a lot of money to the, to the Soviet Union. I think that's wrong. But uh, the Soviet Union and the Soviet system, communism can't even feed their people and we're there bailing them out again. They couldn't win in Afghanistan. So therefore, I don't know why we have to subsidize the Soviet Union at the same time we as Americans are told that we have to spend $300 billion a year in the military industrial complex stopping the spread of communism. It doesn't make any sense. Another international question. Somewhere in the Middle East, nine Americans are being held hostage. If you were commander-in-chief and Americans were held hostage, what would be more important to you, their individual fate or the commitment that the U.S. government must never negotiate with terrorists? And if any Americans are held hostage, to what lengths would you go to rescue them? We, as libertarians, and I as a libertarian president, would approach it quite a bit differently than what's happened. We'd address the subject of why are they taking Americans hostages? Why don't they take Mexicans hostages? Uh, why don't they take Canadians hostage? And uh, there's a good reason for that, is that we are always interfering in the internal affairs of countries all around the world and picking and choosing sides, sending money and weapons to everybody, and they get very angry at us. So our support for the Shah. Worry as much about them, uh, but we get this out of perspective. But I, as a president, would go to them and I'd say, look, it's all over. We're changing our policy. We're getting out of your affairs. We're not going to support your enemies. We're going to support a, an American position, which is friendship to all. And we're coming home. And we're going to mind our own business. I believe the hostages would be released. It could not be construed as, as selling out to the terrorists. And I think there would be essentially no more hostages taken. But the fact that we're forever involved in getting into the affairs of all the other countries and getting in the midst of war. This ridiculous idea that we had to be in the Persian Gulf getting between, between two warring factions like Iraq and Iran. I mean, how can we as Americans pick between those two nations? Besides, that was a total military failure anyway. And I think it's very important that we reassess foreign policy. Foreign policy is at fault, 
not negotiation and not the silliness of trading uh, weapons and fighting secret wars. That's all a consequence of a bad policy where we assume that we have an American empire, that we have to police the world and bankrupt this country. We ought to have a strong national defense, but we ought to have a policy designed for the protection of the United States and quit sacrificing ourselves to our rich allies and quit sacrificing ourselves to our enemies like the Soviets. A question with both uh, national and international perspective. As many U.S. farmers face or undergo foreclosure at this time, the U.S. is meanwhile considering the possibility of forgiving a certain percentage of debt owed by Latin American or third world countries. Do you favor giving these countries a break on their loans? And if so, how would you explain that to the American farmers who are losing their land and their livelihood? Well, I think it'd be a hard time explaining it to them. I think the uh, people who borrowed money are responsible, but the whole bailout of the third world debt, and right now it's $1.2 trillion, and it will never be paid, and it's a financial time bomb hanging over our heads, and the sooner we realize that, the better. The Brazilian solution under Jimmy Baker was that we get the banks to give them another $5 billion, give them a line of credit of $15 billion. They make a few token loans to the New York banks. The b banks look like ha they have a better profit sheet, and it's all guaranteed and protected by the American taxpayer. And then they took the debt, strung it out over a longer period of time, and reduced the interest rates. That's a default, uh, even though the American people don't realize that. And the American people will have to back it up. I think the main reason why some want to bail out, both Republicans and Democrats are orchestrating to bail out the third world debt. They're talking about bailing out the big banks in this country who were stupid enough to make all these loans. And I think they should suffer the consequence. I don't think the American taxpayers should pay. All they're looking for now are the victims. And right now, the way they're moving under both Republicans in the administration and Democrats in the Congress, the patsies are going to be the American taxpayer. That's who's bailing them out. And I think that uh, we shouldn't bail out farmers, we shouldn't bail out anybody. But it certainly would be evil to bail out foreigners and New York banks at the same time you foreclose on the American farmer. I think that's terrible. Two questions that were asked during the debate dealt with individual positions, but we'll try to synthesize them into something that applies. Uh, the questions dealt with national defense and focused in each case uh, with the Republican and Democratic nominee upon which weapon systems they believe should be kept or eliminated. Your views on this defense issue? I think we need a lot less weapons. We certainly could do with a lot less nuclear bombs. We have uh, nearly 14,000 intercontinental ballistic nuclear warheads. And uh, we probably could do quite well with a thousand. And even if we stretched it to two, we could bomb every, every military facility. 260 of the major cities, all their command posts, and all their industrial sites twice with a thousand. We could put enough weapons to bomb them three times on six Trident submarines. And we have 36 nu nuclear submarines. We already have way too many weapons to be able to retaliate if for some foolish reason, for some unknown reason, the Soviets would attack us. Of course, as long as they're getting subsidies from us, I don't think they're going to likely do that. I think that we don't need any new weapons. I think we should retain the right to develop the weapons that we need. So I think uh, this idea that we would develop SDI and then turn the technology over to the Soviet Union, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I think if we needed a decent weapon and developed it, we certainly shouldn't uh, sacrifice it. And this idea that we build an MX because we need it for our defense and then we use it as a bargaining chip. If we need it, why do we use it as a bargaining chip to give it and, and then do it in a trade? We would do a lot of what they pretend to be doing unilaterally. We'd bring our troops home. We'd bring our missiles home. We'd be less provocative. We would let them know that we're going to defend this country. We'd have our submarines out there. But we wouldn't play silly games by subsidizing the military industrial complex by building MX missiles and midget men and, and more submarines, uh, attack submarines, which we don't need. We don't need tanks. I don't know where the people think we're going to have a tank war. I don't know where they think the Soviets are going to attack us through the Alaska with tanks or what. I think that it's time we change our attitude about policy and we should have a strong national defense, 70% of our military budget is being spent overseas. We could spend a lot less money. We could cut $100 billion out of the military budget and not sacrifice one thing on defense. Matter of fact, I think we'd have a better defense. Congressman Paul, the uh, candidates were given two minutes to sum up. Uh, 
looking for a level playing field on this, uh, our version of the debate. Uh, you have two minutes to sum up your message. Yes, I think the American people certainly deserve a choice. You know, today we're drifting into a situation where the uh, s political system is controlled by a monopoly. There's only one party, really. Republicans and Democrats are exactly the same. There's absolutely no difference. It's Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Not only that, it's financed by the American taxpayer. The American taxpayer has been required to put into the coffers of the Republicans and Democrats $100 million. We are excluded from the debates. They are afraid, really, of true debate to talk about the issues, talk about the balanced budget, talk about foreign policy, talk about the role of government, talk about freedom ideas, talk about the Constitution. So therefore, we are in a desperate need in this country to have choices. The Libertarian Party and the Libertarian message offers a choice. It offers a choice for the American people not to have to vote for the lesser of evil. If you vote for the lesser of evil, you still vote for evil. The majority of the American people today are not Republicans or Democrats. 37% of the people planning to vote prior to the debates said they were undecided. After the debates, I'm sure that number has gone up. Therefore, I see it as a tremendous opportunity for us if we can only get the message out and tell the American people you can vote for something. Don't drop out. Don't stay at home. Vote for the principles of freedom. Vote for the libertarian message. Vote for the American tradition of limited government. Vote for the American tradition of a sensible foreign policy where we are neutral and where we have a strong defense and we don't sacrifice ourselves to everybody in the world. So there is an opportunity. I'm not sure that opportunity will be available to us in five or ten years because I think we're coming desperately close to a financial and political crisis. The stock market has already crashed. There's economic problems on the horizon. The debt is now $2.6 trillion. The foreign debt is $1.2 trillion. So therefore, it is up to us as libertarians to offer this message to the American people. It's a beautiful message. It's a message of freedom and hope. A free society and a free market provides the greatest amount of wealth and the fairest distribution. If anybody is concerned about their fellow man, they really have to be a libertarian. Because if you care about poverty and the poor people and the ripping off of the system by the wealthy and the military industrial complex, they have to be libertarians. Libertarianism will take care of the people, provide the prosperity and the peace that we all want.